Uh, before, before we begin, I, I just want to uh, uh, acknowledge the work of uh, our staff on both sides who have uh, helped with this hearing. Uh, we appreciate your work and to uh, uh, make it known that uh, we have one of our staffers, Charity, who has done a lot of work on this. Uh, she uh, could not be here today because of, a, uh, of an illness. We look forward to her return, but she did a lot of great research, and I just want uh, to acknowledge that uh, for the record, actually. So uh, thank you. And we're going to go to our second panel of witnesses. And I would like to introduce them. We'll start with Ms. Kelly Cobb. Welcome, Ms. Cobb. Uh, Kelly Cobb is a survivor of E. coli poisoning and has come here today to share her story with us. Her husband, Matt Cobb, serves in the United States Marines and they're parents of two young children. Uh, Mr. Scott Horsfall, did I pronounce that right? Is the Chief Executive Officer of the California Leafy Greens Marketing Board. Mr. Horsfall has served as Chairman of the United States Agricultural Export Development Council, was a member of the Agricultural Trade Advisory Committee for Fruits and Vegetables, and is past chairman of the Produce Marketing Association's International Trade Conference. Mr. Dale Koch. Welcome, Mr. Horsfall. Mr. Koch, welcome. Uh, Mr. Koch is a farmer and a member of the Community Alliance with Family Farmers. Mr. Koch is also the founder and president of Koch Farm, a produce cooling, storage, and shipping company located in San Juan Batista, California, which represents local California organic growers and selling throughout the U.S. and Canada. He's also a partner in, Jard in Jardines, a diversified organic farming operation growing on approximately 500 acres in Monterey and San Benito, California counties. The sixth generation of his family born in California to work in agriculture, he pioneered spring mix lettuce and was instrumental in developing its market. Ms. Caroline Smith Duwall, is that the right pronunciation? Uh, welcome. Ms. Duwall is the Director of Food Science at the Center for Science and the Public Interest, where she is a leading consumer analyst on reform of laws and regulations governing food safety. Since 1999, she's maintained and annually published a list of foodborne illness outbreaks organized by Food Source that now contain over 15 years of outbreak reports and has presented at numerous conferences. She's a co-author of the book, Is Our Food Safe? A Consumer's Guide to Protecting Your Health and the Environment and has authored numerous papers on food safety. I want to thank uh, the witnesses for their presence here today. It's the policy of our committee on oversight and government reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you rise, raise uh, your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that. Each of the witness, witnesses have answered in the affirmative. As with panel one, I ask that each witness give an oral summary of his or her testimony. I'd uh, like to see you keep that summary, maximum five minutes in duration. Any testimony that you want to add beyond that, your entire statement will be in the record. Anything you want to send to this committee within a few days, we'll get that in the record as well. Your complete written statement will be in the record. Now, Ms. Cobb, welcome. I'd like you to uh, be our fir first witness. And would you please begin? And I would, uh, before you start, just pull that microphone a little bit closer because we want to make sure we hear everything you say. Thank you. There you go. In May 2008, I was busy as a stay-at-home mom to my two children, Liberty, who was three, and Matthew, who was one at the time. We were in Washington visiting um, family from California. Matt wasn't. No, I'm going to. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to ask staff to take the responsibility of making sure that the microphone is. 
close enough so that the witnesses can be heard. And frankly, I don't want to have to bring that up in a hearing again. This direction, so you have to and talk right into it. Sorry. Do you want me to start over? And just please speak. Uh, you have a very soft voice, and, but we, it's really important that we need to hear what you're saying. So why don't you begin at the top? Okay. In May 2008, I was busy as a stay-at-home mom raising my two children, Liberty, who was three, and Matthew, one. We were visiting family in Washington from California. We were there without my husband because he was serving as a Marine in Iraq for the second time. On May 10th, my mom invited me to go to a banquet dinner with her and some of her friends. Little did I know by accepting her invitation, I would be changing my life forever. That night, um, I ate a salad that was contaminated with E. coli. My mom, my children, and her friends that were there with us um, happened to sit at the same table. I just happened to pick the seat that was contaminated. Um, my children were there with us. My son was on my lap, but luckily he didn't eat greens at the time. On May 10th, I was getting ready for our drive back to California. I went to bed that night with a stomach ache and woke up um, on May 16th with uh, diarrhea and the most painful stomach craps that occurred every 10 minutes until my, stern, my stool turned to blood at about five o'clock. I then proceeded to go to the ER where they just said that I had a bacterial infection. Um, I went home and was not able to hold down water, the medicine that they gave me, and I returned to the hospital. Two days later, I was told that I had the E. coli and that was the, pain, that was the cause of the illness, that it wasn't the bacterial infection. Well, it was bacteria, but not what they thought. I was discharged from the hospital only to return a couple days later because I developed a condition um, of HUS and was told at that time that my kidneys were only functioning at 50%. I was then started on plasma phoresis where um, they cycled out my blood and put in the, the new stuff. Um, over the time that I was in the hospital, I had over 50 blood draws, two ultrasounds, a CAT scan, um, a colonoscopy, seven IVs, a central line in my neck, and four units of whole blood and 80 units of plasma. Both my husband and my father were in Iraq at the time. I had to send a Red Cross to um, my husband to let him know that what was going on. He was unable to come home. I had the kids. Um, I was the only caretaker with him being gone. So my mom took over that responsibility and set up child care for them while she was at work. They came to see me at the hospital every day and they didn't understand why I wasn't able to go home with them, why they couldn't stay with me. Um, they were so young that they don't, they didn't understand what was going on. Um, there were several times that I didn't think I was going to make it because of how sick I was. I remember on one day, um, I think it was the 28th, I had an allergic reaction to some pain medication that they, I was given, and I got intense chest pain. And um, I remember blacking out and not really knowing what was going on. and. I honestly thought I was gonna die right there, the hospital bed. My husband was in Iraq, my father was in Iraq, the kids were at home, and that I wouldn't be there with them anymore. Um, and with that, I was able to really focus on what the nurses were telling me. Um, and they gave me another medication to help with the, the reaction. Um, from that incident, from the E. coli, I no longer eat any produce that I can't see being washed myself. I have gone to restaurants and asked them how they prepare their salads. Um, I cut everything, f or I clean everything from a bag of lettuce to a watermelon, because when you cut through it, it's gonna hit your, you know, your fruit. Um, the time I have with my family means so much more to me now, because I know that at any time it can be taken away from you. I, I was, I'm honestly surprised with how sick I got that I'm, I'm here today. Um, if anything, I would want the parties that at fault in my particular case to know that, you know, they took me away from my kids for two weeks and that's a time that they'll never get back. My son was one, that's, you know, he developed every day that I was gone. He came to the hospital saying new words every day, doing new things. And 
I felt the pain that no, I can't, I can't describe to you the pain that I was in because I don't have a comparison that I could give to you. I would rather, you know, I said I'd rather break bones than go to that, you know. I would rather have a broken arm right now than go through the pain that I felt in E. coli because I don't have a comparison to actually give to you on what I felt. And, um, you know, it could be their family. It could have just as been easily been one of my, my kids. And had it been, I, it would have been devastating to them what I went, went through. Thank, thank you very much for coming here to testify. Uh, we're certainly going to be having some questions of you when we uh, go to that phase of this hearing. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask Mr. Horsfall to uh, proceed for five minutes. Thank you uh, very much. Well, you, before you proceed, I want to welcome some of our visitors here from uh, China, Macau. Thank you for being here. So please proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, and good afternoon, uh, Chairman Kucinich and Ranking Member Jordan. Um, it, I, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I am always happy to talk about our program. I'll get to my statement. I, I would express to Ms. Cobb that what she went through does not fall on deaf ears in our industry. Um, uh, shortly after I started this job, uh, the, the, the USA Today ran a recap. It was a year after the, uh, the original outbreak. And they presented the stories of the, the, the four or five people who had died because they ate spinach. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know because I work with this industry that they, that they take that to heart. Um, they are trying to do everything they can do so that there aren't more victims, uh, so that we can reduce that risk as much as possible. Um, so I, I know I've used part of my time, but, but uh, the, the Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement was established in 2007. It is a mechanism, quite simply, for verifying through mandatory government audits that farmers of leafy greens follow a rigorous set of food safety standards. Uh, we are an instrumentality of the state of California, and we operate with oversight from the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, in the, although the leafy greens industry had always prioritized food safety, in the aftermath of that outbreak in 2006, farmers and shippers and processors recognized that more effort was needed to protect public health. Uh, the question was how to do it, and a lot of different approaches were looked at, including regulation at both the state and national level, uh, marketing orders, uh, and, and a marketing agreement, and the decision was ultimately made to, to, to go with the tool that was most readily available, which was a marketing agreement. Um, it is a voluntary organization, but it does have the, the, the force of government behind it. Uh, our members, when they do join, it is mandatory that they follow the, uh, the, the rules of the program. Um, and and the, the idea was to, to use this marketing agreement. It also has a flexibility to change and amend the program as we get new research. And as you've talked about research a lot already this morning, and we are keenly interested in research that's being done so that we can make the program better. That flexibility is actually one of the key benefits of, of the LGMA structure. Um, our program is focused on prevention, on preventing the introduction of pathogens into leafy greens fields and farms. Uh, we applaud the Obama administration and the President's Food Safety Working Group for their focus on prevention and their approach to improving food safety. Uh, on July 7th in their press conference, we're happy to hear Vice President Biden and Health and Human Services Secretary Sebelius talk about prevention as job number one. Um, I was asked to talk about where our metrics came from. As the LGMA was being developed, there was a parallel effort to create a set of food safety practices and standards, um, sometimes referred to as good ag practices or metrics. Uh, they were developed by university and industry scientists as well as other food safety experts, uh, farmers and shippers. Uh, those standards were reviewed by FDA and the USDA and other state and federal health agencies. Um, they cover the major risk areas that have been identified by FDA and other food safety experts. Practices include careful attention to site selection for growing fields based on farm history and proximity to animal operations, appropriate standards for irrigation, uh, water and other sources of water, prohibition of raw manure uh, and the use of only cert certified safe fertilizers, and of course, good employee hygiene in fields and, and harvesting. Um, the, uh, our members are subject to mandatory audits 
by the California Department of Food and Agriculture to ensure that they are in compliance with the program. Uh, those auditors are uh, USDA trained and the process that we use is a USDA certified uh, audit process. Uh, our members face penalties if they are not in compliance uh, up to and including decertification from the program which can lead to serious uh, significant uh, economic repercussions for the company. Uh, from July 23rd of 2007, when we first began our auditing, uh, we have done over 1,000 government audits of our members, um, and those continue today even as we speak. Uh, we all know that maintaining food safety vigilance is crucial to the future of the produce industry, uh, and while there is still very much to do and we're not done, uh, I believe that the, the leafy greens industry is doing more to provide a safe, wholesome, delicious product now than they ever have before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Horsfall. Mr. Koch, you may proceed for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Kucinich and Ranking Member Jordan. Thank you for inviting me to here, here today. Um, I've been asked to address the impacts of California leafy green metrics on farming practices. Uh, for growers in California, it's estimated that the uh, economic impacts are on the order of about $18,000 per year on average per farm. That would be higher for larger farms and possibly less for smaller farms. Growers have to, um, of course, do testing of water, fertilizer, soil amendments, um, and anything else that goes on to the crop. They have to document uh, all of this, they have to be aware of animal incursions, um, pay attention to uh, vegetation, um, and then also provide some kind of traceability. Uh, traceability is not such an issue for a grower like our ourselves. Uh, um, organic growers have had to do, uh, be able to trace product for years. Uh, there's also been prohibitions against manure use for organic uh, production. For years in compost, uh, there's no sewage sludge or other kinds of toxic chemicals you use. But organic growers are facing uh, significant issues with the push for the, the regulators to have uh, to ban you know wildlife and and non-crop vegetation, things like windbreaks and habitat, uh, which are things that are supposed to be encouraged by organic laws that pertain to maintaining your certification. The um, environmental impacts often vary uh, depending on the inspector and his interpretation of uh, the metrics. There are certain companies that use their own metrics, which are called super metrics in the industry. Um, wildlife, non-crop vegetation, and water bodies are normally viewed as food safety risks. A lot of environmentally positive uh, projects have been abandoned uh, or by growers who have been threatened with the, the loss of the ability to uh, sell their crops. Windbreaks, uh, vegetated filter strips, tailwater reuse reservoirs, grass roadways, vegetated ditches have been removed to comply with you know, the inspectors that come out to, to check on the, on the crop. Many fields have deer and pig fencing, but some also have frog and rodent fencing, um, even though those haven't been found to be a vector of pathogens. Some of the fields for leafy greens use uh, traps, poison traps for rodents. Um, secondary poisoning of raptors and owls can occur with this. Um, and a lot of these practices are more based on the processors uh, having problems pulling them out of the harvested crop because of the nature of the harvest of the crop than it is, has to do with being a food safety issue. Um, practically, this has been a big step backwards for environmental protection. It was just starting to move forward on farms. Um, there's a lot bit more money and time that farmers have to spend trying to comply with these metrics and document this. Uh, the majority of the disease-related outbreaks, food disease-related outbreaks that are associated with leafy greens um, come from pre-cut, processed, uh, 
products. Um, there's some kind of failure during that process to make it ready to eat it, or to keep, make it clean enough so you don't have the pathogens. Uh, saddle processors tend to point to the fields as being the issue. Um, it's very difficult for farmers to grow in a sterile crop in, a, in an open field. Um, you do have, you know, we have always had employee hygiene. We're concerned about our compost and we don't use manure. We test our water and our fertilizer as many farmers do just to make sure that you're not part of the problem. Um, now leafy green farmers are now in the unenviable position of uh, having to pay for and comply with a roster of unproven safety metrics and attempted to, attempting to grow pathogen free crops and um, being held potentially liable for it. Uh, the California Leafy Green Marketing Agreement um, is made steps in the right direction, I think, for the processed uh, product that it should be representing. Um, I don't know that marketing agreements are an appropriate way to provide food safety, whether they be a state or national. They are in my mind, there are something that uh, focuses on marketing product rather than on actual, you know, conditions of growing product. Uh, this being said, um, if this were to be moved in that direction, if the focus on was just on processed food, you would reduce a lot of impact on. There are a lot of farmers that don't grow. Leafy greens that go into um, into bags, and uh, they would be, ex you know, if the focus was just on the processed arena, you could exempt them. Right now, the and I was there when they started having the meetings to decide about leafy greens in California. They included specific vegetables, and I asked why those, why they were in just including a few vegetables. There was no answer because they, they didn't differentiate whether it was a uh, whole head or a bunched product. It was just, we're going to include these vegetables. And the only reason I can come up with is that it's uh, something to enhance their competitive edge because it gives them a marketing advantage if you need to adhere to these metrics and you kind of raise the bar. A lot of farmers w might not be able to make that. I, uh, I want to thank uh, the gentleman for his testimony. Your entire statement will be included in the record. Okay. And as someone who's been so involved in the development of, of uh, this industry, we appreciate okay. your presence here. Uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Smith DeWall for five minutes. And after your testimony, we're going to uh, go to a round of questions of the uh, panel. You Thank may you. proceed. Thank you very much, Chairman Kucinich, and also uh, Representative Jordan. Uh, my name is Caroline Smith Dewall. I direct the Food Safety Project for the Center for Science in the Public Interest. CSPI has concerns about the increasing use of marketing orders as a vehicle for regulating safety. Fifteen different agencies administer 30 different laws that regulate food safety in the U.S. today, and marketing orders really represent a further fractioning of this already uh, widely fractured system. Foodborne illness outbreaks linked to fresh produce are among the major public health problems when it comes to food safety. And leafy greens and salads are among the top food categories, along with beef, poultry, and seafood, that cause both outbreaks and illnesses. In addition, the average size of outbreaks linked to produce tends to be larger, so they tend to affect more people. The importance of robust and reliable food safety practices on the farm cannot be understated. Leafy greens, once contaminated, can support, grow, and spread pathogens until they're consumed. Chlorination and other post-harvest controls can help reduce cross-contamination between different lots of salad, for example, but they don't make contaminated product, product that comes in from the farm contaminated, truly safe to eat. In fact, scientists have shown how bacteria can inhabit the washing systems used for bag lettuce 
and transfer bacteria from a contaminated lot really onto a full day's production of leafy greens of salads. While FDA has jurisdiction over on-farm food safety, it really has not acted as an infect effective regulator. And they've been using for at least the past 10 to 15 years the, the concept of guidance, unenforceable guidance to the industry instead of regulations. But the absence of, of enforceable rules leaves a significant hole in the fabric of food safety, allowing and even encouraging the industry to weave standards of its own design. The Agricultural Marketing Service has served as a friendly regulator of choice when food safety problems arise. At AMS, the food industry can draft their own rules called marketing orders or agreements to best suit their needs. But AMS is not equipped to monitor the safety of food. The primary focus of AMS is with the pr promotion of food products. And the mechanisms that it uses are limited in terms of their geographic scope, and, and often they're completely voluntary. These are voluntary systems, and farmers have to agree, and the handlers have to agree to comply. So they're limited to U.S. companies. Sometimes they're limited to companies just in the state of California. And this is particularly troubling when you consider that uh, consumers, 13% of our diet is from imported produce. So a huge amount of produce is never going to be subject to these marketing orders. AMS oversees marketing orders for 22 different commodities, including things like almonds and shell eggs. And these programs can really instill a false sense of security, both for the industries involved and for consumers, because they really are quality programs. They're not based on safety. But given the absence of rulemaking at FDA, it's not really surprising that in the aftermath of the 2006 spinach outbreak, the leafy green industry turned to AMS to create these stronger rules. I just want to note that the, these standards really do create uncertainty. And they give rise to the private standards, which are actually the complaint of many of the growers today. The growers today are saying these, private, these standards are too burdensome. But let me cl be clear, these aren't mandatory standards. They're not FDA standards. They don't apply to imports. So it's critically important that we actually get a system in place that will protect the public. The Food Safety Enhancement Act, which is before the House of Representatives, addresses this issue head on. It requires FDA to consider both the food safety and the environmental impacts when promulgating regulations for food production. It requires the standards to take into account small scale and diversified farming, wildlife habitat, conservation practices, watershed protection, and organic production methods. This is all in the legislation that's before the House. This provides an appropriate focus on public safety. It gives the farmers and consumers both an opportunity to weigh in these, on these standards, which we don't have today with the AMS standards. And it would protect the sustainable and organic farming communities that we all value. These are the type of standards that consumers cannot live without. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. By the way, just an update, the bill that was voted on did not receive the required two-thirds, so it will end up going back for some work. And yeah. some of the concerns that were expressed by members who voted against it is that they were concerned about the effect of the bill on small farmers and organic farmers. So yeah. I think that um, the center, which endorsed the bill, uh, needs to take heed of the concerns that are expressed. And I think if, if, it, if, we, do, if we do that, Perhaps when the bill comes back out to the floor, we can see it uh, pass. Uh, thank you. Well, that means uh, we'll have five minutes, each of us, for questions. Uh, hold on a minute. Let's see. This is the House Democratic Club going two bells, pause five bells at 4.24 p.m. 
Advise members they have 15 minutes to record their vote. On suspending the rules and passing H.R. 3357, to restore sums to the Highway Trust Fund. This is a 15 minute recorded vote. This will be followed by three postponed five minutes. Well, that, that really does mean we should move this along. I, I just want to um, thank Ms. Cobb. How are you feeling, by the way? Um, I'm fine now. How many uh, years ago was this? It was May 2008. And do you, have you felt any um, after effects other than no. the fact that you're not really keen on eating certain no, products? Yeah, other than at home. No, there's no... I am at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease later in life and um, urinal type issues, urinary tract. Um, but as of right now, I've had none of that since that same summer. We're glad you're here. Thank and you. I, I think people need to, to, there needs to be a public face of somebody who's dealt with this and you've dealt with it. and takes out of courage to come before a congressional committee to relate your experience, so we appreciate that you're here. Thank you, I appreciate it. The other thing I want to I note is uh, um, when Mr. Horsfall began his statement, um, I, I was impressed that you said that Ms. Cobb's testimony doesn't fall on deaf ears. That, that was a real, you know, what I saw as a uh, unrehearsed response to hearing what you had to say. And I just want you to know I appreciate that because sometimes we get uh, people come in here with a story that can be very difficult and the individuals who may have some responsibility generally in that area seem to be impassive about it and you showed that some concern and I think that's, uh, uh, that speaks well. I, I'd, like to, I'd like you to address the uh, concern about some of Calma's metrics. Uh, and the arbitrariness of them. Your, your auditor must find that the adjacent land to a field of green must be free from compost operations within 400 feet of the crop edge. What only requires that the adjacent land free from uh, grazing to the land's uh, domestic animals within 30 feet of the crop edge. What's the justification for allowing domestic animals, the uh, uh, animal waste products of which are a component of compost, to be closer to the crop edge than a compost operation. The, uh, the, the LGMA program is, in, in, you know, the, the metrics are based entirely on risk assessments. Um, and, 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 and I think that's in keeping with FDA guidance and, and well, you know, well, in, the in a, I know, I'm, I'm getting to it, pardon me. A, um, the, go ahead. The, the, the compost operations are considered to be a very high risk situation in terms of pathogens. We also have you know, significant buffer zones if there's a confined animal feeding operation where you have a large number of animals of risk in, in a field. That also requires... Remember, you've got domestic animals field. closer domestic to the animals crop edge and, than and the compost be, operation. Because the, 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 the risk assessment tells us that there's a lower risk involved if you've got a, 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 a couple well, of animals on a farm. Let's look at the 2006 spinach incident. Isn't it true that the field identified as the source of a contaminated spinach was less than a couple hundred feet from where domestic animals grazed and shaded themselves? Uh, I don't know that for sure, but I, well, let's I'll check take it out, okay, it. and I, see if we can I maybe can you could look at sure. that. Maybe we could come to some kind of a conclusion if there's any contradiction there. Isn't it true that Calma's auditors? would not today find any problem with growing spinach intended for the ready-to-eat market growing a couple hundred feet from the land where cattle grazed exactly the conditions present in the 2006 spinach incident? Uh, I, it would depend on the number of cattle that were there, uh, and, and I don't have those numbers in front of me, but uh, uh, in that particular case, the, uh, the final report, as I recall, you know, the, 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 should, the feces that was found that had the, the same fingerprint was over a mile away. Should, should Camel be tougher on the processors who make the bag lettuce than it currently is? I think processors, uh, if I can address that, processors are under the jurisdiction of FDA. They what are about all, Calma, they are already I mean, should, inspected. You know, we're looking at possible, possible nationalization of this. Should, count, should uh, Calma be tougher on these processors. You've heard testimony here. What do you think? Did you say did, should cattlemen? Should, should, should Calgma be tougher on the processors? Oh, Cal I'm sorry, I'm not used to that. Who make the, the, ba the bag lettuce, and it currently is. I think that processors need to be regulated just as heavily as growers do, uh, and that regulation, I believe, is in place okay. for FDA. Appreciate that. Um, 
I just want to do one more question here. Um, uh, Mr. Koch, you're the father of the spring mix. Spring mix helped pre-cut packaged leafy greens become a vegetable consumers like and eat in increasing portions, significant health contribution. But you're also a critic of the ready-to-eat leafy green industry. In your opinion, is there a way for the American public to get the convenience and health benefits of pre-cut packaged vegetables without the harm to farmers you mentioned in your testimony? Yeah, just a point of clarification, uh, developed the concept of spring mix, uh, never put it in bags, and it was never ready to eat. It was a field-run product. It was uh, washed, cooled, and packed, dried and packed into uh, three-pound boxes. But it wasn't, uh, you know, I always had serious reservations about how that product was displayed, and I didn't ever want to go into uh, and what, what would be the long-term results, uh, Mr. Koch, uh, in your opinion, uh, on the environment if CALGMA is nationalized in its current form? In its current form, uh, it, I think it will affect too many growers of uh, lettuce and cabbage and kale and chard, the things that are traditionally harvested as whole heads or, or bunched items because they don't make a differentiation between it. Um, those things haven't had any outbreaks associated with them. People, uh, they often have a kill step associated because people um, heat them up before they eat. They steam them or boil them or roast I've them. got some uh, follow Thank you. I have some follow-up questions to uh, Ms. Uh, smith DeWall. We're going to put them in writing. Okay. And I want to go now to Mr. Jordan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief as well um, since we have a vote pending. Let me, too, thank Ms. Cobb for, uh, for being here. And um, how, are your, how are the little ones doing? They're doing fine? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, they're, Matthew doesn't remember he was too young. Liberty still remembers, and we'll talk about when I got sick from a salad. She knows what it was from. For a while, she would tell people not to be afraid of a blood machine because she remembers coming in while I was having a transfusion done. But overall, they're doing, they're doing well. Well, and let me also thank your family for their service to, uh, to our country. Thank you thank all you. For, uh, for, for being uh, with us. Now, let me just get a couple of basic. Where, where, where's your home state, Mrs. Cobb? Um, my home state is Washington. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Horsfall, the, the program is um, completely voluntary. Is that right? The, the 120 yes. people who represent 99 percent of the volume. I'm looking at the, I think this came off your website for LGMA. Um, 120 handlers, 99 percent of the volume of California leafy greens. That they're all voluntary. Those 120 who joined. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is uh, what's the what's the assessment? How's that determined again? We assess our members based on the volume that they ship. It's a penny and a half per 24 count equivalent box. And I just want to be clear: are are big producers part of it, or are these are the people who? We're, in other our, words, are the farmers part of the organization, or is it just the folks who take the farm product and then package it? Our members are handlers. Uh, they are the people who put product into commerce. The are majority some of, the handlers, of them, are some of the majority handlers, of them, are growers as well. They're, they're both. Yeah. So some are both. Some of them yeah. actually produce the product and handle Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So right from from the field right to their operation, it could be around the same premises. Mm -hmm. And they sell to each other. Pardon? And they sell to each other as well in the okay. industry quite a okay. bit. Okay. And since um, since you've come into existence, which was 06, 07, what year? 07. Ha have there been uh, any any outbreaks of, of E. coli or any, any problems? There have been outbreaks um, that have been reported. I don't know that, I don't believe the health authorities have conclusively finished their investigations yet to say where product got contaminated, but the, there was a small outbreak in Washington State uh, that Ms. Cobb was affected by. Uh, last year there was an outbreak in Michigan. So can you definitively say that we've seen an improvement um, in that there have been less problems since your organization has been formed, or is that anyone's guess? Um, I, the answer is yes. Fewer people have gotten sick tied to lettuce and leafy greens in the last two years mm -hmm. than, say, in the two or three years before that. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, I, I, I don't take that as a metric. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think we still, if anybody's getting sick, then we still have to figure out how to make the program better. Okay. Um, and that's where the research comes in. Again, okay, now, Mr. Koch, um, are you a, um, you're a uh, farmer and a, and a handler. I mean, you, are you part of this organization, your, your farm, your operation? I'm, I'm not. Um, we, we, I have, there's two different entities. One is a um, sales shipping cooling company. The other is a farming company. The farming company contracts with a um, handler 
that is signatory to that, and we grow some crops, you know, cilantro, dill, and parsley mm -hmm. in this case, for inclusion in a salad, um, that they want to be grown under those metrics. Mm -hmm. um, so we do that part. Otherwise, uh, we have a diverse crop mix. Uh, there are only a few things that are, would be considered leafy greens, um, and I've uh, I've resisted. Uh, because I think it's, you know, the principle is wrong of this agreement, and so I, I didn't want to. It's cost me uh, the ability to sell into Canada because they won't accept product, even though, you know, we're organic and we test mm -hmm. soil and water, and they won't accept product that's not, um, if you're not signatory to the leafy green marketing agreement. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'd prefer not to go there. You know, have to. I was hoping that something would, you know, become a little more logical, so you... Yeah. You know, focus on the process. I, guess, I mean, just as a, just a you know a country boy from Western Ohio, who um, you know didn't didn't grow up on a farm, but we live out in the middle of my wife's family's farm. It, it seems to me that the, the problem is, you know, you, you think about whether it, the product is grown close to composting site, or whatever. I mean, I remember when they used to spread manure on the field. I mean, so it's it's like it seems to me the problem has to be after the product's taken out of the field. I mean, that's just common sense. But uh, yeah. Maybe I'm. No, maybe I I'm think just you're, a country boy. I think you're right. Something and, and the product has got issues. The, the slide that you showed about the uh, bagged, you know, it's a, I mean, it's a great concept to give people something that's ready to eat, but it's, it's a perfect incubator. I mean, how do you keep that? If you, if you can't sterilize it, how do, you know, if you've got any little pathogen and you're, you break the cold chain, I mean, even a customer just taking it out to their car and then driving home, you're, it's potentially, it's a, it's a difficult issue. To, mm -hmm. I mean, a product to get to market yeah. Yeah. safely, I think. We, we have to vote. Thank you all for coming. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to. Uh... I want to thank uh, Mr. Jordan. I want to thank the witnesses for being here. I'm Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee. Mr. Jordan is the ranking member. Our hearing today has been ready to eat or not, examining the impact of leafy greens marketing agreements. We've had two panels. Uh, the testimony has been very important. We appreciate your participation. This committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Because the Palms Fantasy Tower might just be the hotel with the most over-the-top amenities on the planet. Next stop on our tour of America's most over-the-top lodgings, Dolores, Colorado. Remote mountain ghost towns. By definition, they're places people have left to rot. But tourists are actually going out of their way to visit this one in the middle of Nowheresville, Colorado. It's an entire abandoned mining town that's been transformed into a luxurious resort, Dunton Hot Springs. Welcome to Dunton Hot Springs. It's a series of beautiful miners' cabins and cottages we let out to people. Quite off the beaten path, and it's just got a lot of history. Basically, 22 miles from a road, which is another 15 miles from a tiny place that if you blink, you miss. And this place hasn't changed much from the 1880s, when Dunton was a pioneer settlement deep in the secluded San Juan Mountains, and home to miners, trappers, and even the odd gunslinger. It was a mining town. 1886 is when it was first built. But by 1918, the jobs in Dunton had dried up, and it became a ghost town.